to, to introduce myself first. Uh, hey everyone, my name is uh, Kami Rincon. I am the research assistant in uh, public. Yep. Uh, I'm the research assistant in public sector AI ethics and governance at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, but I also conduct uh, research on risks and opportunities for LGBTQ people across branches of AI, and then more specifically on uh, trans people and voice AI is a lot of the work that I've done. Yeah, so I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, Joanne. Oh, hold on. Yeah, so I yeah, unmute myself. Um, so hi everyone, um, my name's Joanne Monk. Um, I was awarded an OBE in the uh, Queen's New Year's Honours List uh, 2021 for services to transgender equality as a global LGBT advocate and independent advisor. I am global head of education and national head of diversity, equality and inclusion for Believe Global CIC, the Believe Foundation, which is a startup charity supporting victims cross gender, totally inclusive um, of domestic abuse. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, Amrita, if you want to say say a few words, yes. hello. So Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. So I'm quite excited. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I can see my friend Pavel here. Hi, Pavel. So uh, it's great to see all of you. So uh, yes, I am Amrita Sarkar. I work in India. This uh, organization I'm working for is called India HIV Alliance. I have almost 20 years of experience of working for transgender people and also for the LGBTIQ community at nationally and globally. So I'm associated with very much other things. So Becky know that. So I'm not wasting my time. So thank you everyone once again. Thank you. Right, great. Thank you. And George? Uh, hi, I'm George. Uh, I am a teacher of religious education in a Catholic school in Leicester. Um, I am a transgender man and I'm also trying to work with kind of local diocese and um, education unions uh, to make sure that LGBT inclusion is fully embedded in Catholic schools. Okay, thank you. And Michelle, I hope you've managed to join us. Michelle, okay, we will hopefully um, have uh, the panelists join later. Uh, Pavel. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is Pavel, Pavel Sagolsen. Um, I am a queer feminist activist. I identify as a non-binary femme person. Uh, I belong to the northeastern part of India, but I've also worked in Delhi and uh, other parts of the country for about seven, eight years. And lived experience of queer people, gender equality, engaging with men and boys for gender justice, uh, women empowerment are some of my key areas. And I'm also co-founder of this uh, digital anthology project called the Chinky Homo Project, which is also trying to bring in representations and visibility of uh, queer people from Northeast of India. Um, in India, what happens is um, Northeast uh, of India, which is actually towards Myanmar, is uh, very less represented and also less documented. And uh, so um, growing up there, uh, we faced a lot of isolation and we also faced a lot of um, you know, like trouble trying to find our own identities. So that's something me and my friend David co started. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. Okay, super. Okay. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. So, what we're going to do is um, we're going to start and and have this sort of five minute, um, e each panelist can do that. But I wanted to just very quickly say that uh, this conference is called Digital Innovation in Mental Health. Uh, one second. There we go. Uh, it's called Digital Innovation in Mental Health. But the conversation that I want to have at this conference, it, it's, it's beyond technology. It, we have to bring technology into the real world. So uh, I just want to make that very clear that for any kind of technology expert or startup in the mental health space watching this, uh, this is an opportunity to learn and to understand, to develop more sensitive uh, approaches or perhaps not. So we just have to take the technology and expand into uh, real real people's um, lives. So uh, what we'll do is we're, we're on time. This is great. <laughs> so uh, Cami, do you want to uh, kick things off? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about my past work uh, within uh, exploring the needs and experiences of trans people in voice AI. Uh, but I do want to use that more than anything as an example to uh, discuss the question of, of how to balance um, having LGBTQ community data on one hand, while also preserving uh, the safety of, of data subjects. Um, and really what I'm trying to get at with, uh, with what I'm about to discuss is I would really like to complicate this notion of data visibility as a contextless benefit. And, and the way that I wanna do that is by discussing some of the experiences and needs uh, of the participants I've, I've worked with in the past. Um, so really first to touch on this sort of double-edged sword between uh, data visibility or trans competency and services and then safety on the other hand. Uh, on the side of, of, of data visibility or uh, competency, so trans people have been uh, great, greatly omitted as uh, populations of interest, both within uh, industry and academic discussions, uh, exploring gender-based harms within technology. So uh, gender is very much treated as uh, both binary and implicitly cisgender. So when you think about critiques of voice AI, for example, a lot of these focus on uh, the potential impacts of, of voice AI on cisgender women, not a lot on uh, the experiences of trans and non-binary people. Uh, an example within healthcare that might be uh, just easy to, to illustrate the potential harms of a lack of inclusion or lack of data visibility is, um, for example, automated invitations for cervical screenings are not designed really to include people that have changed their um, gender marker on their health record from female to male. So although these people are eligible and vulnerable to um, cervical cancer, they, they're not included within this technological intervention, so they don't have uh, equal access. So that's an example of where data visibility, for example, is something that is potentially important and uh, also important to address some of the health disparities experienced by the trans community. Now, uh, on the other side, uh, when we think about increasing data visibility, it's important to contextualize this within the lived experiences of trans people. And at least the, the individuals that I interviewed, all of them described um, living in contexts in which they navigate uh, threats to their psychological, emotional, and physical uh, safety on a regular basis. Uh, they very much described uh, a lack of support and understanding being the mainstream with the exceptional uh, safe spaces that they have to intentionally seek out. Uh, and this is important to contextualize because when we think about data visibility and safety, a lot of times we're imagining this um, potential third actor, but actually there are real legacies of distrust between trans communities and developer communities, as well as trans communities and public sector institutions. So there is um, a trust that needs to be rebuilt between trans communities and service providers. Now, um, these sort of uh, risks in safety are, are present in the physical world, but can also be very much aggravated within uh, the digital world. So trans people very much experience disproportionate rates of online harm, things like doxing. Um, the thing is that uh, trans identities can be uh, weaponized. So an individual's belonging to the trans community in itself can be used as a weapon against that individual. And digital technologies, um, pose a variety of risks that um, could potentially exacerbate what is already um, understood as context of, of, of high risk for trans individuals, their emotional and their physical safety. Now, when navigating the, the way forward uh, between this tension of um, visibility and safety, um, I think it's important to stress that, that trans individuals need uh, differentiated security uh, mechanisms so although these are issues that are um, experienced by anybody in terms of data privacy, uh, it's important for designers to offer a shift in power relations where individuals don't have to offer um, their data, uh, but rather have to opt um, automatically, but rather have to opt into this. And specifically as related to identity, it's important for individuals to be given the agency to personalize their data and for them to be able to go in modify, delete their data, and ultimately being able to access whatever services they can possibly access without having to share basically anything with developers. And I would pose this as a way to start rebuilding this trust. Now, I wouldn't say that um, a privacy only or a technological solution would address this, this bigger issue, but rather within my research, what I find is four uh, design requirements. The first one being privacy, which is more or less what I just discussed. 
Um, the second one is uh, services that address uh, the needs of trans people. Now, if you're going to be asking trans people to offer their data, ultimately this has to be supporting something that is going to uh, benefit or advance their embodied well-being. And there's a lot of opportunity here, as we know, especially when thinking about mental health, because there's a lot of disparities experienced with trans people. So ultimately, technology can be used to advance and to help bridge these disparities. Now, lastly, and perhaps the most important, I would venture to say, or as important, is the fact that products and services need to be co-designed with uh, trans communities. Um, this idea of assuming the needs of trans people is not something that will work. And you'll see this in terms of invoice assistance, for example. A lot of the fixes for a lack of trans inclusion have encompassed this idea of non-binary um, or genderless voices. And this actually doesn't address trans people's main concern, which is privacy. So ultimately, in order to regain this trust, it's important that trans people are involved in the design process and that they're given real agency in design so that designers can be accountable to this. Now, with all of these prerequisites met, then I think we can start asking questions about uh, data representation as well as user facing representation. And if we're able to do this, we'll sidestep some of the potential harms that come when moving into representation, which a lot of have to do with the notion of pinkwashing or essentially showcasing spaces for inclusion that actually don't meet the most salient of needs by communities and that actually in one way or another intentionally or not exploit the the lived vulnerabilities of trans people by portraying what may be um, perceived as safe when actually not meeting all of the the most salient needs that that help uh, mitigate uh, vulnerabilities experienced by trans people um, I don't know if I went over five minutes uh, I do apologize for that that is that is absolutely fine. That was amazing. Um, really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, and if anyone has questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to now move to Joanne, if you'd like to. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so hi, everybody. As I said earlier, my name is Joanne Monk, um, OBE for Services to Transgender Equality in the New Year's Honours List. Um, my knowledge of certainly transgender mental health in, in the digital side of things um, isn't really in depth, but what I, what I would like to talk about is mental health, um, a little bit about um, how we can support um, transgender people in the workplace, um, and a little bit about domestic abuse. Now, the past 18 months or so with COVID um, has seen a big increase in mental health issues uh, to the transgender community in particular, um, obviously to many, many people um, outside of that. But the problem is, is a lot of transgender people haven't been able to access the support services that they really need. Um, that might be doctor's appointments, appointments um, for hormone therapy, um, gender reassignment surgery has been pushed back years, particularly in the UK. Um, the waiting list, I think, now is about four years. Um, so there's been a lot of stress associated with it. Um, and we have to be aware of that. We have to be able to support our transgender um, community in a respectful manner. Um, I myself don't identify as transgender anymore because um, after my gender reassignment surgery, I obtained a gender recognition certificate and now have a new birth certificate. So I'm legally female. Um, touching on um, how we support uh, transgender people in the workplace. And this is absolutely, it's quite a passion for me. Um, I am an ambassador and consultant on the board of an organization called Includability, which is a subsidiary of Ellis Knight International Recruitment. Um, and we've already, um, you know, pink washing's already been mentioned, but the whole idea of includability was set up so that um, organizations would commit 
100% to being inclusive in uh, <clears throat> who they offer employment to. Now, as it stands, there are many issues that transgender people um, have in the workplace. One, that they don't want to come out. They're, they're frightened to come out in the workplace. They're frightened to share their feelings with, with colleagues because they worry about the fear um, that may develop from that. And that can be tied in with unconscious bias. It can be tied in with microaggressions, which happen all too frequently. And unconscious bias is one of the big stalling uh, blocks to um, employing people from the diverse community. And that is born out of fear of the unknown. That's, that's basically how unconscious bias happens. We've all got it. Um, every single one of us has a degree of unconscious bias. Um, but it can be controlled. So how does an organisation support our transgender community? Gender neutral toilets is an absolute bugbear of mine. They have to be in place. There's no reason why any organisation can't have gender neutral toilet washroom facilities. Do they have people that can understand and be allies to the transgender community that work for them um, so that somebody that is thinking of coming out as transgender, whether it be man or woman, um, they've got somebody to talk to. They've got an ally within the organization. They've got somebody who understands what they're going through. And that is also very important. But it's all about having um, champions as well diversity champions and a diversity champion could be a member of within an organization of uh, the lgbt community it could be a member of the of race ethnicity community disability anything connected with the um, protected characteristics that certainly in the uk we have under the equality act of 2010 um, I'm, tr I'm trying to watch my, my watch. The other thing I want to talk about is um, domestic abuse. Um, and that's partly because of my job. Um, but domestic abuse is absolutely rife in the LGBT community. And the reason for that is that when uh, a member of the LGBT community comes out to their loved ones, um, to their, their, their spouse, their partner, their family, they can very, very often be the victim of domestic abuse. And sadly, they're very reluctant to report it. And what all, often happens is that those people then go on to develop mental health. So we've got two in one there. We've got domestic abuse and we've got mental health issues. And a lot of um, domestic abuse goes unreported because of the lack of trust in the law services um, to actually follow through and prosecute. And it's very important, and this is part of my role as Global Head of Education, to raise awareness, particularly for the LGBT community going through abuse, um, for people to recognise signs, to know what to do when they see domestic abuse, and to know what, they, what to do um, to support that person and signpost them to the right place. And it's all about safeguarding that individual. I think that probably wraps up mine. That was that was incredible. And um, I, I didn't want to do it while you were speaking, but I'm going to put some links in the chat and it refers to um, a couple of things that you were speaking about. So uh, there's there's a talk by another speaker looking at gender neutral washrooms and things. So uh, that was very interesting that you you touched on that. But of course, the seriousness of of domestic violence and the connections you made with mental health were very powerful. So thank you. Um, now we've got um, our next panelist, Amrita. So I will pass it over to you. 
thank you becky so uh, i will uh, basically uh, you know talk about uh, giving some overview a summary about our current situation in india i mean uh, the transgender community how we are facing problem the challenges our legal st status and what could be the way out and talking about the digital presence in terms of mental health aspects really uh, i mean there's uh, nothing has been done so far because uh, when i will uh, talk uh, this uh, challenges then you will de definitely understand the you know the gaps actually so uh, who we are actually in transgender if we say transgender people as all, all of we know that uh, the people who are uh, you know assigned a particular sex at birth but following the gender norms of the of, of opposite sex but in india we have uh, many states and we have many uh, our local identities also so that is because of uh, different language different cultures uh, i mean different behavior and uh, but most of the time we have seen because this is a patriarchal ca country so if uh, someone is uh, trying to you know prefer to be known as a female or a trans person or someone who is identified as a non binary or gender non conforming person definitely he or she has to you know be uh, i mean face so many challenges in uh, their lives and talking about our legal context uh, in 2014 actually we had a very bold uh, judgment given by supreme court of india that was called national legal service authority uh, versus union union of india it's called nalsa judgment also the, uh, and that affirmed actually that people who are transgender uh, you know they will be uh, able to ac uh, access uh, all the services just like other cisgender people and they uh, do not have to go any kind of a, like a medical check up or medical you know treatment to be you know identified as a male female or transgender person but very very unfortunately that uh, is uh, uh, not in place anymore because now we have transgender person protection of rights act and that actually is uh, like uh, some good points and some bad points are there so in terms of identity so one has to go to the district magistrate first has to get the certificate then again to get uh, the like uh, binary identity like male or female again has to apply with all the medical document and it's like uh, taking time and it's a uh, i mean people who do not have much resources people do not have you know not uh, much uh, like informative or not very much technical sa sa I mean, sound they are facing the problem and uh, the, the gaps are like uh, if we say about marriage act if we say about the rape law property inheritance uh, law adoption law there we have no presence and uh, if we you can you know uh, assess the disparity i mean in the transgender act it is clearly uh, told that if um, some trans person is being like uh, abused or you know raped or uh, sexually abused the perpetrator will get the punishment that will vary from 6 months to 2 years but in our country for the cisgender woman i this is at least 7 years so these are the challenges even in the legal strata and the talking about the other like core challenges that we are facing every day and that is actually ha hampering our mental health our physical health everything so this is about uh, no access to public places and even in the healthcare facilities also we have hiv aids intervention program for the key populations but there also they are facing so many stigma and uh, discrimination and uh, at the family level at the school level also the picture is same so if we see the education rate as per our 2011 census that is very very much poor and homelessness is another issue because if someone is migrating from um, uh one place to another place or living family for work or any other re, uh, problem actually and if uh, he or she is labeled as a transgender person it is very very difficult to get an accommodation and uh, i will e echo the same problem you know uh, mentioned by uh, joan that in the covid uh, pandemic also uh, there is no specific data that how many transgender people are actually affected and how uh, the you know we are facing the challenges of problem and uh, absolutely the same thing is happening here o also people who are going through the transition process their gender affirming care the surgeries everything you know gets postponed 
and uh, because of lack of information because of lack of m money most of us uh, people i mean they go for self medication process i mean if I'm, i have a friend who is using hormone and then i i i, I i'm just uh, without consulting any doctor i also you know start to take the same hormone so this is a very common practice here and that is very much affecting our uh, lives and uh, definitely uh, there are other problems if, if i talk in terms of marriage uh, adoption rape laws and all so uh, the <clears throat> talking uh, uh, about my organization india hiv aids alliance we, we are not uh, yes we are an hiv aids organization but we are not typically focused on hiv aids only if we talk definitely about the transgender people i personally am uh, working with national aids control organization to you know uh, make the hiv aids inter intervention program for the transgender person to be more integrated with other services including uh, gender affirmation care legal aid uh, livelihood training and all so otherwise uh, this is not going to be solved because throughout my ex experience uh, i mean i have been uh, i have uh, working for, for for my community and uh, i mean not only in the major cities but also at the rural uh, level and uh, there i have seen the education the information among my community member is very very less actually and in terms of access to basic care like education health care that is absolutely difficult for them so keeping that context in mind uh, uh, i i strongly suggested along with my other fellow you know friends that the hiv aids program also needs to be very much inclusive and community friendly and that should be linked with other services otherwise the health problem is not going to be sorted so if i say that uh, in terms of way forward definitely uh, there should be a mechanism that uh, policy makers the community members that organization they have to come to together and uh, there should be capacity building of the community based organization on all the areas the challenges they are facing and definitely data more research more study survey definitely needs to be initiated and uh, uh, there should be a constant advocacy not only at the state level but at the national and uh, a global level also that trans transgender people and gender non confirmed non confirming people are not mentally ill are not physically ill at all so that is it and uh, i will stop here and definitely i will welcome if there is any question thank you thank you so much this is so much context and different perspectives coming through so i'm really grateful um george hi um so it feels like um, everyone is amazing on, on this call so far. Uh, so I don't know if I feel like, you know, pretty tough acts to follow. Uh, so I'm just really going to share some of my experiences uh, of the both positive and negative in terms of um, health, healthcare, uh, and at work, you know, what kind of things work, what kind of things definitely need improving. Uh, so I came out to my doctor in November 2017 when I lived in London. Uh, and said that I wanted to be put through for a gender referral. So I was uh, living unhappily as a woman, uh, but had been processing for about three or four years uh, that I was trans. Um, so I was 23 at the time, and uh, the doctor just said, are you sure that's just really popular at the minute? Uh, when I first kind of said it. So she wasn't, she wasn't particularly on board anyway. Um, apparently sent off the referral. I then moved to Leicester uh, and rang up the um, the gender clinic, the NHS one in uh, London, uh, and just said, you know, I'm just checking, has my referral kind of come through? Will I need to have it uh, moved to somewhere closer to me now, or can I just stay here? Uh, and they said that they'd never received the referral. Uh, when I tried to ring the doctors to speak to them, I wasn't allowed to speak to anybody either. Uh, so couldn't couldn't figure out exactly what happened there. Uh, fortunately, at the gender clinic, they were they were quite good to me. So they actually um, they I sort of explained that it was sent off in November 2017. This was January 2019. They said, "Well, we've popped your referral in, and we've popped it in at, at, at the time that you said it it went, in November 2017." Uh, I had a letter last year that said you will be seen within 36 months of that. So you, I, I would have been seen in November. Um, 
November 2020, uh, then COVID hit, and I've heard nothing since. So had I still been waiting on the NHS, I wouldn't have had uh, access to hormones uh, or uh, any surgeries, uh, which I have had so far. Uh, that, however, has been very expensive. Uh, so I went privately, first of all, for hormones. Uh, wasn't sure wh whether I was going to go privately for surgery. Um, but I have been on hormones for two and a half years. Uh, the first initial appointments cost something like um, £300. You have checkups every maybe 18 months or so. And they, again, somewhere between £150 and £300. Um, obviously I've got a prepayment certificate, but the prescription comes out as a monthly cost, uh, because I've not been into the gender, uh, identity clinics. I've not been able to get there, uh, yet. Um, I have paid for my own kind of counseling. Um, and th there's not, there's not loads of gender specialists kind of out there anyway, but I have fortunately managed to find two good counselors, uh, both in Leicester and in London. Um, so I've spent, yeah, roughly, well, £10,000 on surgery, but then a little bit more on other things as well. So it is costly. Um, not everyone could afford to do it. I, in fact, couldn't afford to do it unless, you know, my parents paid for the surgery, which was divine. Um, so, yeah, I found the, the first part of, of my healthcare kind of journey was, was quite difficult, actually. Um, and it seemed to be that, you know, there was obviously it was maybe it was just the one doctor I'd seen but I, I was really struggling to get through to anybody who could kind of give me any answers um but moving forward I've got a, a lovely nurse um at the moment so she does she takes care of all my injections so I was having them once a month once every three weeks every two weeks now a bigger one once every 12 weeks um but she like she sort of really looks out for me uh it had my old picture on the systems it was my doctors from when I was a child and she said I don't know if you know if that offends you or bothers you but just so you know obviously when it comes up on anyone's screen that you're here uh that's the picture and, and obviously it doesn't look like you uh so she made sure that got removed for me uh she also kind of just suggested when I've been in there to do kind of cervical screening, uh, which obviously Cami kind of mentioned earlier, uh, I wouldn't normally kind of have access to that now because my medical records do say male, uh, my, you know, my identification does. However, I don't have a gender recognition certificate. So my birth, birth certificate still says female. Um, yeah, so that's, there's been an upside and a downside certainly to me accessing healthcare uh, and I've, it's it's good now but um, it, it wasn't always very easy and certainly as a, as a newly kind of out trans person that can be quite worrying when you can't really get through to anything where you can't hear about what's going on um, so I'm still in a waiting game for that at work okay I can do some positives and negatives about work as well so I work in a Catholic school um I left the Catholic school I was in previously so I was in a Catholic all girls school uh in London that had two pupils that came out as trans uh, and the head teacher wrote a very nice letter kind of saying that that um that we as a school are supporting them in in kind of you know uh becoming the person they believe God has intended they are, um, that they'll support name changes and pronoun changes. And it was it was really hit um, by Catholic media. Um, a parent took their child out of the school. Um, yeah, uh, there was like lots of petitions to kind of say, you know, this is this is not Catholic. It's not right. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so I I was like, I obviously I, I can't transition here because I'm also a teacher of religious education. So the expectation, although you don't have to be, the expectation is that you are a practicing Catholic. And some people would question whether I could be a practicing Catholic and transgender. So I now work at the secondary school I went to as a child, uh, which is lovely. Um, they did say when they when they took me on, I, you know, I'd literally just started hormones a month before. Uh, I hadn't had any surgery. Um, you know, they sort of said, actually, you're a normal appointment to a job. So, you know, that's all we, what we want to show here. Uh, but they did say, you know, you don't need to talk about your transition. And that I found has been quite unhelpful because kids want to know and they, they don't, if, you know, if no one's educating them, they don't necessarily know what's right or wrong. Uh, and in fact, you know, the, the school itself has done a couple of things, um, a couple of things kind of that, that, could be kind of classed as discrimination really. Uh, so I was told I can't have my pronouns in my email address um, because it's not necessary. Um, I also got, I got a verbal warning for having an open social media account that spoke about my transition. Um, and it was apparently because all staff are supposed to have private accounts, but there are 
there are lots of the leaders there that had open accounts as well. Um, so it's it's all kind of I think there's a there's a they it seems really like they want to shut the conversation down, whereas opening the conversation up is the way that things get better for people. So you know sessions like this um that probably do me I think I don't I don't know I didn't I've not been doing timings at all so. and and I've gotten lost in that I was completely engrossed um <laughs> so we're a bit over time but we're still uh we've got plenty of time so um I'm just gonna do a shout out Michelle are you with us um okay then I think what we'll do is go to Pavel please if if uh you're with us okay great Hi, hi, thank you, Vicky, for inviting me and uh, such a pleasure to listen to all of the people. I think a lot of issues has been really covered. So, uh, um, you know, it was such an amazing introduction by Cami and then going on to Amrita and uh, George and uh, Joanna. So um, I think I'm going to sort of bring in a bit of my experience and also a bit of learning uh, that I did because I studied gender studies. And also I'm gonna also bring in a little bit of what I experienced as working for the queer community. It's, um, you know, particularly as a researcher of lived experience, part of it has been also about access to healthcare and um, some just try to just bring it and connect it all. Um, so um, back when I was I, I did gender studies, I came across, uh, it was a fabulous time, like just exploring been questioning myself a lot, been, uh, you know, been a good student. So I was able to get into good universities, but somehow I always felt disconnected from whatever I was being taught. I always felt like it was about the other person and I always had to learn about the other person. And I was really struggling to find like, when will I actually get to learn about myself? And um, still, I think even transgender studies is not really there. Uh, even, uh, you know, like even the feminist, uh, you know, discourses or even the feminist studies or gender studies still pertain with women and men. And uh, a lot of things has to be done there. That's the first thing I want to flag off. Uh, but yes, but there's within this ambit of studies of feminist studies or gender studies, um, you know, we do get have we do have the avenue to bring our experience, my experience as a non-conforming person, as a gender non-conforming person, and also got the privilege to also a lot of uh, sort of look at it. Although it was a little ill-formed because hardly any literature to fall back on uh, theories and stuff like that. But yeah, but there was a lot of learning from these feminist methodologies and feminist. Um, concepts that I came across. Uh, one of them being this thing called social determinant theory. Um, it was uh, part of the gender studies course was on health and uh, health and also uh, linking it with governance as well. And, uh, and one particular theory we came across was called social determinant of health. So it is not just about physical, of course, like the, uh, uh, it's not just about like uh, physical imbalance or hormonal imbalance or uh, health has a lot to do with what the environment that surrounds us, what are the psychosocial factor, the cultural factor, economic factors that surrounds us. It's not just about body and the physiology of it. And that was really incredible because uh, that's where the mental health comes in, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of the mental health symptoms are psychosomatic. And uh, when it becomes psychosomatic, when you start feeling it in a physical form, that's when a lot of incapacitants, that's when your uh, functionality sort of get uh, reduced, uh, you know, and then that also becomes another way for transgender people, gender and conforming people to be judged. When we couldn't do, we can, when we couldn't perform, we are always considered as lazy, you know, somebody who, is, who doesn't have that spirit in them to work hard. Uh, I've, I mean, uh, I've also faced this in my own, uh, in my workplaces, wherever I work at certain times, I'm not really able to perform. And that is not because I'm lazy or that is because, that is not because I want to enjoy it. It's just that um, dysphoria can also, uh, you know, come and affect you in so many ways. And sometimes it comes as in terms of mood swings or depression, sometimes it comes in the form of physical discomfort and you're just not able to focus. And people don't, not many people understand that. However, when I worked in a, in a queer resource group, Nazaria Queer Feminist Resource Group, uh, there was a fair bit of understanding and it was very enabling. And this is something that I also want to leave behind for people to reflect on. Um, also, yeah, social determinant theory. So a lot of things like, for example, first mental health, which has been broadly discussed by other panelists. I'm not gonna go into it. But the second thing is also migration, which has been spoken about. But what does migration do onto us is that why do we migrate? It is for a sense of belonging. 
you know people actually confuses uh, trans people who run away from home to really not love family or their culture or their region because a lot of them also migrate from one city to the other and that when we migrate we are able to sort of live behind prying questions which we have been facing since we were kids it also provide us a sense of anonymity which sort of like gives we feel like it gives us a chance to relive our life to reconstruct our life to sort of explore our identity and it does give us a privilege but at the same time it puts you amid strangers and foreigners and a place that you have no idea about and the first task is to assimilate oneself to that foreign place and that itself is a huge burden upon us and second thing is also this unpredictability of how long am i going to survive and sustain myself in this foreign place and that always constantly act as an anxiety you know and also like when at home um you know when lacking a certain cultural capital because you're migrated to a region where you don't have people you have to build from scratch and uh, a lot of our uh, economic capital also comes from our cultural capital also i think my, uh, being in a good mind space being able to perform all this contributes to you actually being able to build up a, a, an economic capital for yourself but when you're faced with all this anxiety you know you're not really able to really do it and you building up from a scratch from a certain age also doesn't really help you so you're always so so basically our life in a foreign a foreign place where we are migrated or run away or even if it's in the same city when we are run away from home or even when at home also because i've also come across a lot of trans people who constantly talk about being neglected by their family you know where their cis gendered um siblings do get a lot of uh, social support and emotional support and the family are so constantly concerned about how to provide them with a career option or a sustainable livelihood but none of them really talk about them they feel like you know so that's why we're always feeling like always i mean so that that leaves us to a certain mode of survival and when our life is basically mode uh, basically based on survival which again can be translated into you know like being able to provide for food being able to provide for a house and all of this are really costly to to look at it so healthcare then becomes a secondary or tertiary priority so so i've come across in the research that we did in delhi and elsewhere in the country about you know transgenders and what are the socio cultural region they don't access healthcare it comes out to be the fact that instead of spending that money on healthcare they'd rather try to do some home remedy and save that money for emergencies emergencies doesn't include health emergencies include when they are being thrown out of their fam uh, of the of the house they're renting because we don't know how the landlord will react you know we always feel like we are living under the uh, what can i say um um uh, people's pity you know it doesn't we doesn't feel entitled and we don't feel belongs so we're always in the constant threat of being thrown out of where we're living so this kind of thing you know or um yeah certain things like that or or also even if even if we have run away from home and it's also runs in the uh, narratives of a lot of trans people we do contribute a lot as much as we can to the family back at home so if somebody that is near and dear to us reach out to us and ask us for help we want to be there you know so such kind of emergencies we always try to save up so healthcare doesn't really become the priority for that reason um you know so economic status uh, also one we we are all aware about how trans people are never given employment and the kind of employment that we have to resort to our contractual uh, work or you know like sex work or or work which are not really sustainable and we also don't know how long will we be able to sustain a job you know so 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 we we would like to save up saving up also doesn't happen because there is such a lot of necessity for us sociality means a lot because we have we knew um i mean for 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 somebody who constantly live in fear and anxiety of life being taken away by anybody by at any moment or being thrown into some uh you know like thrown into trouble any time we know what is the value of happiness we knew how to sort of like enjoy and celebrate our life and that also becomes a priority that becomes a certain communal uh, way uh, something that a community does to celebrate that's why we drink together that's why we always looking forward to party together because we know that our life can be taken away at any time so while we have it i'm i'm want to live the best of it so that also becomes a burden on us to sort of sustain money for that as well so health you know doesn't become our priority um 
then comes to the access which uh, Cami had very well uh, spoken about you know like there are a lot of free and uh, a lot of free access you know like free services for trans people which has come up uh, 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 which is about uh, providing free and uh, affordable access to trans people but there is a lot of suspicions because what we have really come across is that such kind of really sorry to say that it has definitely changed the quality of life for trans community but still it also comes from a certain mode of disciplining or providing or some sense of say looking at us as a target population and that really doesn't fit in with our struggle we're struggling to for dignity we want to tell the world that we are much more than what they stereotyped us as. We want to tell the world what our personality is, what our quality is. We don't just want to be seen as a subject or a data. So people don't access these spaces. They'd rather not go for these health services and feel down in their own spirit or feel embarrassed in front of their own eyes because that's what they've been doing. Running away from home, it's not really good. It's not something that everybody wished to do. We've been forced to do, we've been driven away. The life that we live, the struggles that we live, it's not really our choice, but we do it. We do it because we want to prove to the world that we can. So anybody coming and doing free service, really welcome, but we prefer that it comes from a certain sense of respect for us, where we are given a certain sense of dignity and not necessarily seen as a number. And a lot of people do not go for that as well. So, um, you know, like, um, so there's a lot of things when it comes to such spaces and a lot of this, uh, you know, like um, um, uh, programs and a lot of, uh, you know, all this initiative that is being done towards the queer people. There has, I feel like there has, there, there, you know, I've also been part of it, advocating for it, trying to get people to get to it and also being critically an, an, uh, being critical about it and looking at it from an analytic, analytical sense. And I feel like there also needs to be a sort of turning the table. You know, as what I said, we are not data. You should, we are not data, we provide you information. So actually we are the one with the wisdom. You, and uh, you know, it's very important and we're not looking for acceptance. Don't come to us with that, you know, with that propaganda oh, oh, of how we accept you and all of that. No, come to us and tell us you wanna learn about us. That really makes us feel respected. And then we will come forward and also contribute to your effort, you know? And we also feel ownership and leadership that way, which is very important. You know, uh, something about the trans people, like we are not given leadership or ownership, even in efforts and even in, even in projects that is actually about us. We always seem to look at this target population and that really doesn't work for us. And uh, another thing uh, is that, uh, you know, this, something that Cami also said, and I'm going to uh, reiterate it, is that this kind of, Cami talk about how uh, when devising such plan and programs, we need to consult with the trans people. Yes, of course, we need to do that. And this programs and plans need to come from the lived experience of the queer, of the trans people. Mostly it comes from the experiences of cis, uh, capable, able, able person, and setting their life as a standard and then trying to tell us that we want to sort of uplift you from where you are. No, we don't need that. What we need is somebody who gives us empathy and listens to us and somebody who's willing to understand us. No, we don't need to become another person than we are. We need the governments and we need this program to know who we are and design and develop a program that actually fits into our chosen lifestyle. Um, that's very important. So it should not be just about service. It should be about giving leadership. It, it is not, you're not doing due service to us. It is your responsibility, actually. It is, you're not doing any, any favor, but rather you're keeping up with what is due from your side as uh, leaders, as, you know, program people. Um, Pavel, I'm just sorry to interrupt you, um, but we're going to be wrapping up the session now. Um, so just if you had a final thought, I don't want to, uh, I don't yes. want, you know, please continue, but we will, um, wrap it up. Yeah, all right. So the last, I will just end it up. The last thing that I want to talk about is that, uh, you know, um, mindfulness, uh, what, what a holistic uh, program or what a holistic uh, understanding of well-being of our trans people should provide to the trans people is to allow them to understand the self-care that they need to be, to allow them to uh, come to a state of mindfulness about themselves 
and that basically as i said with so it has to be about your experience about your journey and not necessarily comparing them to other uh, sections of the population and um, yeah and also let's uh, i also come across like how uh, you know various uh, social uh, social media or any uh, popular promotions of trans active uh, you know trans affirmative practices or any services for trans there is a lot of competitions that they put up about trans people within trans men and trans women or among trans women or between non confirming genders you know we we don't have to do that the first thing is that just as men as, as women are so diverse and ethnicity Okay, Pavel, I think uh, Pavel, desires, this, ambition, the signal is quite poor. It is also just like that trans very Pavel, the, yeah. the signal was quite poor. Yeah, yeah. So my first speak are very diverse. But thank so, oh. Are you able to hear me? Uh, I, I am, but we I've unfortunately I have to wrap everything up now. So uh, but I would love to keep the conversation going. Um and I'm happy to uh, yeah, yeah, to, to do that however we'd like. But I want to just thank all of the panelists for um, such different perspectives. It was really incredible to see just how complex uh, everything is. Um, so yeah, again, just thank you all the panelists for your, your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk, Becky. Much appreciated. Cool. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Great opportunity. So and, um, good to listen to all the other panelists. Great. Yeah. Bye, Bye. Take care. So, thank you. Take care.